Today, we're doing something a bit different. We're staying in the realm of causal inference, and I'm very excited that we have Sebastian Martinez here today to talk to you about his research on causal inference in the presence of interference, specifically looking at generalized propensity score application in a public health context. He'll tell you all about that coming up shortly. We'd like to keep things engaged uh, and engaging in the BEMP. So if you have any questions during the talk, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote others' questions and we'll hopefully have a nice lively discussion at the end of the talk. If you're willing to uh, be promoted to a panelist, just let us know. We'll bring you up here in the circle. Last month, we had quite an engaging conversation. So please feel free to join our panel. We'll also stop the recording then. So hopefully we can get some a bit more lively discussion going today. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sebastian, who originally studied mathematics as a bachelor. Then he has a dual master's in economics and public policy and is almost done with his PhD in the Department of Statistics at the University of Glasgow. Hopefully I got all of that correct. He'll tell you all about his work today. Um, he also loves food, fun fact. In the times of Zoom, you always have to share the, the fun fact. And we're so grateful that he's taking the afternoon to talk to us. So Sebastian, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Jess and team very much. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. I remember that a couple of years ago, I attended the seminar or the colloquium and I was fascinated by the range of speakers that you have and I feel honored to be one of them. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, share. I hope that everyone can see my slides. Is that okay? I just kind of just get a note. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I am going to talk to you about a project that I've been working on for three, maybe four years. And it's just the idea of doing causal inference in the presence of interference. Formally, the talk is, or the paper that we're writing is called Causal Estimation of Spillover Effects in a Social Network Setting, Increasing the Confidence in positive sexual health attitudes. And the subtitle just comes from the empirical application that we have, and I would really like to show it to you if we have time in the end. Um, this is a project with two of my supervisors, Nima Dean and Eric Moody from Glasgow and from McGill. Uh, and um, yeah, so, oops. So, I'll just start with my research question, which is, can we determine the causal effect of an intervention on the treated individuals, but also on the individuals to whom the intervention spilled over? And the short answer to that question is that it depends uh, on whether we believe and we can measure what we believe in terms of the assumption of the treatment spilling over. And just to be clear, what I'm talking about here is the spilling over of treatment, but not necessarily the spilling over of an outcome that then becomes treatment for someone else. And this distinction will be clear soon enough. Um, just a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background of why this is important. I'm gonna talk about the potential outcomes framework and how it works in the presence of interference. I'm gonna show you the estimation strategy uh, a couple of estimation strategies. I'm going to show you some simulation, the results of the simulation, and then finally the, um, the chair on top of the cake with the um, sexually transmitted and sexual health uh, intervention uh, from the University of Glasgow or STASH. And this is an important question because there are many situations in which our treatment escapes uh, individuals. And I believe that we're all meeting here digitally and not in person because of COVID and because this is actually an important question. But more formally, I think that um, there are many things that we would like to, there are many places and many situations in, who, in which we would like to measure if a treatment escapes the individuals who are treated and to what extent it affects other individuals. And so 
information sharing platforms, you have uh, positive effects of vaccines, you have um, interventions that are designed to modify your behavior and then people really like to mimic someone else's behavior. And so there's a chance that the individuals that we're assigned to control, if you do not take care of that properly, might end up being treated just by seeing the behavior of the treated individuals. And of course, masks, because masks are important not only because of how the outside world interacts with us, but because of how we interact with the outside world. And so that there's some reciprocity here in the, in the way that this works. Um, and of course, there are many cases in which the treatment does not escape. Uh, treatment for non-communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases in general. And also when you have really strict and enforceable geographic restrictions for treatment, if something happens in somewhere else, I do not get um, access to that treatment, not even how much I would really want to if I'm not able to communicate with um, wherever that treatment took place. And the important here thing here to note is that I'm interested in communication between um, units. And so I, what I was saying was that I find that this research is amazing and really important because individuals are not draws, independent draws from a bureau of ability distribution, but when you talk to individuals, those individuals know each other. And so there's a chance that if you intervene an individual or do an intervention on an individual, that that intervention is gonna spill over onto someone else and then it's gonna mess up your intervention. And there are many reasons why this is important. Uh, in particular, failing to include the interdependencies between the individuals can lead to wrong or misleading conclusions. Um, and one of the most notable examples here is the a famous, the framing heart um, the Framingham Heart Study, um, where they are alleging that obesity can be um, an epidemic and is uh, you can influence other individuals on this. The assumptions that they use for that study go a little bit um, the opposite in the opposite direction of, of what the literature here is trying to do. Um, there's also something that has been discussed since a really long time, at least since what I can determine to be the beginning of this literature, which is that um, there are competing mechanisms in the way that outcomes are generated, which is that you have endogenous, exogenous, and correlated in, uh, mechanisms, and disentangling these is a little bit difficult. And that the way that we group together as individuals and how we act as a group of individuals um, is has large degrees of confoundedness, in particular when you deal with observational network studies. However, we're gonna move on. We're gonna like keep on pursuing and trying to do this. There have been other ways in which the literature has tried to deal with um, the presence of interference. Um, there's a large section of the literature in which units are allocated to clusters and the interference of the treatment is contained within each one of these clusters. And then the exposure to treatment inside of the cluster is controlled by IPW estimators. And this leads to direct and indirect uh, effects of a treatment. There are also there's also some research that looks at the unit level causal effects, which are famously really hard to um, calculate, but in this case are um, the authors nonetheless try. Um, and then there's uh, Susan Athey and her team have been looking at, at exact p-values using randomization inference, looking at several possibilities of exposure, either one or two or many steps removed from the treatment of an individual. We're going to focus on one particular set of um, papers, in particular this paper by Forastieri, Airoldi, and Meali, which is that uh, we're looking at the identification of uh, and estimation of treatment and interference effects in observational studies on networks. And so this is a little bit um, related to what we're doing, and we're going to we're going to work on this uh, paper and then um, provide some solutions to the problems that we've had. And so. Some notation before I continue. Um, a network 
is defined as a pair of nodes and edges or connections between those nodes. Um, that network can be partitioned as myself, my neighborhood, and the individuals that are not in my neighborhood. Um, and then depending on how you measure the connections, if you have a directed or, or an undirected network, you can have incoming or outgoing neighborhoods uh, around an individual. We have a binary treatment and we have that there's an outcome observed for the different units and that the units have covariates. And we divide these covariates into individual and network related covariates. The neighborhood treatment is just basically the way that my neighborhood or the people around me um, interact with what I'm what I want to do. And there's one major assumption which is really important for the other half of my PhD, uh, which is that uh, the influence network is given and is considered static. This means that um, there is the relationship that I have to other people is deterministic and is given it cannot change over time. Um, there are some other assumptions, which is that my exposure to treatment means treatment. It also means that there is not a full treatment once I'm exposed to treatment, but it means that depending on how I define my neighborhood treatment, I will get that treatment. Um, that I cannot be exposed to more than one treatment unit, which means that if I am treated and I have a peer that is treated, I do not get more than one unit of treatment. And this is also another important assumption, which is that there are no unobserved nodes in the network, which uh, when you consider units to be independent from each other, having a missing observation is important, but in this case, we assume that there is no one who is like a shadow player inside of the network who is playing a little bit more um, of a role that we cannot see. And just to talk a little bit about the potential outcomes, um, I think that this was beautifully framed as a missing data problem in that this is a problem, this is a, a piece of, the, the potential outcomes are just data that we cannot see. And so in this case, we are, uh, in the ideal world, we would like to know that the treatment of I and the treatment of J under no treatment and treatment is observable, but in reality, we cannot observe that. But I write it like this on purpose because I think that this is basically an, uh, a, an abuse of notation because what is actually happening is that we're making the assumption that the, treat, the outcome of I could depend on the treatment to I and the treatment to J, but it actually only depends on the treatment to I under this classical potential outcomes um, approach. And so notation is really important to make sure that we understand which, what kind of assumptions are we making. And so this leads me to the very typical SUTA um, or the stable unit treatment value assumption, which is traditionally made in, in infants research, which is that there are no multiple versions of treatment and that there's no interference between the units of observation. This means that for a set vector of treatment, the outcome that I observe is the same under potential outcomes or under real, the, the actual realized outcome. And that the no interference between units of observation means that it doesn't matter what happens in my neighborhood and outside of my neighborhood, the outcome is the same just because of the outcome of the treatment that the unit I um, receives. But then what does this talk about, right? So uh, the Sutonba or the stable unit treatment neighborhood value assumption, which is the um, assumption proposed by the authors, keeps assumption like the first part of the assumption stable, but it provides me with a neighborhood interference assumption. And it says that considering a neighborhood, I'm going to be able to aggregate that neighborhood. And that if the aggregation of that neighborhood under two different treatment allocation strategies, set and set prime, 
are the same, then the outcome that I observe, considering that my treatment remains the same, but there are two different treatment allocation strategies, um, the outcomes are the same. An example of G is the, num the average number of treated peers. And so if I have 10 friends and five of my friends are treated, it doesn't really matter how many or who of my friends were treated under this example. Um, what matters is that half of my friends were treated. And so G is this aggregation um, that I'm talking about. And basically what I'm looking at is that now my treat, my, the outcomes are the same under my treatment and the treatment to my neighborhood under the aggregation of G. And there are a couple of things that um, are important to unpack here is that GI is this really important aggregation function, which is the thing that determines how the treatment is aggregated and how my neighborhood is reduced to a variable that I can manipulate and that I can use. And that how I define my neighborhood affects the aggregation. And then it's ultimately going to affect the estimation that I'm going to uh, be able to do. And so I'm interested in two things from this intervention. I'm interested in the direct effect of the intervention and then the spillover effect of the intervention. And this means that I'm interested in the way that my outcome changed between being treated and not being treated, which is the um, direct effect, conditional on the fact that my exposure to my neighborhood was the same. And on the other hand, I'm interested in how for a given level of treatment, individual treatment, how does my spillover effect from being affected or exposed to treatment G versus not being too exposed to any sort of neighborhood effect? Um, and if there are any questions about this, please let me know. Uh, like, as I was making these slides, I was thinking that this is a little bit uh, of a dense paper and I'm trying to make everything very clear in the, um, in the way, but if there's anything that escapes me, please let me know. And so, as I was saying, for a given level of spillover, the direct effect, the, the direct effect tells me what is the change in outcome of, for I from being treated to not being treated. And the spillover effect says for a given level of individual treatment, what is the change in outcome for I from being spilled over treatment G to there being no spillover. And I can aggregate this uh, over the directive for the direct effect and for the indirect effect, for the spillover effect as well. And the most important thing that I wanna calculate here is this mu Z G, which is just basically the potential outcome for a particular level of individual treatment and for a particular level of neighborhood treatment. And what the authors of this paper came up with, which I thought was really unique and really interesting is that they defined this mu ZG as a dose response, response, dose response function, which depends on two inputs, the individual treatment and the spillover treatment. And so our task is to estimate this mu of that G so that we can then plug it into the definition of the direct and then the indirect effect in, the term, in terms of the potential outcomes. How do we do that then? The important thing here is knowing that there is a joint propensity score, which determines my individual treatment and my neighborhood treatment at the same time. And that this joint propensity score has some neat properties, which is that it may, it's a balancing score. It also makes um, Y conditionally unconfounded on Z and G, and that I can factorize it in a very pretty way, which says that I can separate the individual treatment from the neighborhood treatment. And so if you think about it in terms of an intervention, basically what's happening is that some individuals get assigned to treatment, and then those treatment, those individuals spill over the treatment to their peers. And so I, 
first have to select some peers. And then after I select some peers, those peers are going to affect the, uh, the, their, their, the peers in their neighborhood, which leads me to these two different probabilities or propensity scores that I would like to calculate. Um, and so this is what we want to do now. But remember, what we wanted was to calculate this um, mu set G because this mu set G is the thing that gives us the potential output. The way that they do this is they estimate the individual propensity score, they calculate a logistic regression, they predict the propensity score for those individuals conditional on the observed covariance, they subclassify based on that predicted propensity score. And inside of, it, of each subclass, they calculate a mu j and they then use a weighted average to calculate uh, the mu hat, um, the overall potential outcome for that, the overall average potential outcome for a given set and a given g. To calculate each one of the individual ones that are in step four, I have some steps that I would like to follow. The first step is that I would like to estimate this uh, neighborhood propensity score conditional that I'm inside of one of these subclasses. And the fact that I'm in one of the subclasses is given by uh, the propensity, the, the set I that I'm observing there. I will calculate a potential outcome. I'm going to estimate the parameters of this potential outcome. And the hint here is that the functional form of this potential outcome that I'm going to calculate is really important. I plug in the different levels of Z and G that I need to calculate, and then I average all these values to get my um, mu J. And so back to where we started, after I subclassify and I calculate the mu J's, I calculate the different, I am able to estimate the mu hat, and then I use the mu hat to calculate the direct and the spillover effect as we defined them before. This is what Forest Theory and them do. What we propose is a different flexible regression that does not require you to know the functional form of the potential outcome that you're trying to calculate, but it gives you a general form of what you're going to try of what you want to calculate, which says that your outcome is your treatment, your neighborhood, the way that your treatment and your neighborhood interact, and then just basically splines on the different individual propensity score and the group of propensity score. And using the same way that doing the same thing that they did, I calculate the potential outcomes by plugging in the values that I need. And this gives me the possibility to calculate mu zj. I can do the same thing inside of the subclasses to see what, what works better. And then I can add two simple uh, ways of measuring my potential outcome, which are just an unadjusted and unadjusted regression. And just to give you a summary of everything that's going on, we have three main estimation strategies. We have the dose response function from the authors. We have a flexible regression that does not consider the subclasses. We have a flexible regression that considers the subclasses. And we have two very simple adjusted and unadjusted regressions that are going to allow us to see how well a normal regression model would be able to determine the direct and indirect effects. And I'm going to do a brief intermission here just to let everyone like catch their breath and understand what we're going through. Remember that what we want to do is we want to calculate the potential outcomes for a given level of treatment and a given level of neighborhood interference so that we can calculate the ways in which my direct, the treatment affects people directly and how the treatment affects people indirectly via their neighborhoods. And so what we want is to calculate the direct and indirect effects. To be able to do this, the authors, but also what we did is we ran a simulation. 
And the simulation is relatively straightforward because I, calc I have a set of individual covariates. I create a network between the individuals in a specific way. I define the network covariates, uh, which is basically how many of my peers have a specific level of the individual covariate that I was talking about before. I generate a treatment, I generate an outcome. And the great thing about having a simulation is that I know what the truth is. And so I'm able to go back and see how well our estimates did based on what the truth is. I run the estimation procedures that we talked about and well, let's see what happens. Just to give you an idea, this is what the result tables look like. And so before I show you a really large table with a whole bunch of numbers, just to summarize the results that I gave you, I would like you to give you the opportunity to understand the, the, the way that the table is physically constructed. And so what we're doing is we're comparing what happens if we do the simulation with a thousand, with 10,000 students versus what happens if we do it with 500 students. And we do each one of these simulations a hundred times. And there are true values to the effects, which we're going to calculate, which we'll see, you will see at the top left um, part of the slide. And then in the table, you have two things. You have, first of all, the bias in the estimation, and you have the standard deviation, uh, the standard errors of the, that's, there's a mistake there. Hold on. Uh, there's a, um, what you're, you're calculating the bootstrap standard errors of the simulation, and you want to see how bias changes with the estimation method when you increase the sample size, and what happens with the standard deviation in between different estimation methods when you increase the sample size. And so the bias is defined as the estimator, as the difference between the estimator and the truth, and the standard errors are calculated using egocentric bootstrapping. And if you have any questions about egocentric bootstrapping, please let me know. I'm really happy to expand on it. I have any thoughts, but anyway. So what happened with the standard, uh, with the bias and the standard errors of the different methods? By the way, FIM just means the Forestieri, Iroldi, and Miali paper. What you can see here is that the FAM method is extremely good at reducing bias in the estimation, but that the splines work relatively well when your data set is large. However, when the data set is not that large, the FAM method, the, the FAM methodology is just basically unbeatable. And this is really interesting because we have our empirical case has 500 students, but the empirical case that they used in their paper has 10,000 students. So, so I really wanted to know what happened when you reduce the sample size and their method is great at estimating when you have a large, uh, a, both a large and a really small data set. Similarly, the the standard errors work a lot better for the FIM methodology. And what you would expect is that when you have a smaller sample size, the standard errors just increase significantly, uh, which let you know a lot of the uh, undetermined variability of having um, not enough people to run the exercise. One second. The next thing that we're interested in is looking at the spillover effect when the treatment is zero. And something really similar happens, which is that essentially the FAM method is really good, uh, but the splines work just as well. But again, when you have a small data set, the FAM method just beats um, the whatever splines method, the flexible methodology that we uh, that we want that, that we propose um, with a larger with a smaller data set. It's it still produces acceptable results considering that you have um, 
not a lot of people, but you have as um, um, you can calculate the standard errors using this bootstrap methodology, which basically says that the splines work really well, but the FAA methodology is just really hard to beat. What happens when you look at the standard errors when this below FA, when when the treatment equals one, and you see here that things start to look a little bit wonky for the spine methodology, but again, the um, FAM methodology, which is just a dose response function, works extremely well in trying to calculate um, the bias of the estimation. But I said here a couple of slides before that the functional form of the parameter was really important. And one of the requirements of the FAM methodology is that it asks you to know exactly what the functional form which, with, with, with which the data was created to be able to produce those amazing results. And we thought that was a little bit unfair because when you're doing an empirical case, you do not know the functional form of the outcome that you want to produce. You have no information about what that function might look like. And so the good thing here is that the flexible splines methodology that we wanted to put, that, that, that we propose is in a way model agnostic. And so what did we do? We proposed a correct FAA methodology, which is the thing that we want to look at the, those response function. We have our model relatively model agnostic, the flexible regression, and we have uh, FAM methodology considers an incorrect outcome model. Basically, it, it, it looks at an incomplete way of estimating that outcome model. And there is really no problem here because uh, no omitted variable violations because we are still including the variables that we're not including in the outcome model in the individual propensity score. And so there should not be um, an um, omitted variable violation. And so what did we find? We found that when you have the incorrect outcome model, the FAA methodology is more biased than we would expect. And the same, it, this stands for both the direct effect and the spillover effect. And you can see here that the bias is almost as large as the truth that we want to calculate. Truth being around three and a half units of um, um, hypothetical outcome. And then we have uh, that this, this happens both when you have the uh, treatment equals zero and the treatment equals one for large and for small data sets, which we find to be a little bit problematic. And so another question that we asked was, what would happen if we had um, the wrong propensity score model? And what we find is that there is increase in bias for the direct effect for both estimation methods but the, the bias in the spillover effects remain, uh, remains relatively uh, constant. A summary of the results, um, the FAA methodology works great with perfect information, but deviations from that perfect information setting in the outcome model are penalized extremely depending on which case you're looking at and that the flexible approach is, could be considered an alternative uh, that has reduced bias penalty. And so let me tell you about the cherry on top, <clears throat> which is the sexually transmitted infections and sexual health intervention uh, carried over by the University of Glasgow. And so basically what they did is they went to six schools, a hundred schools, around a hundred schools inside of each one of the school, sorry, around 100 students in front of one of each one of the schools. And they talked to students that were considered peer supporters, and they told them to spread the educational content that they were trying to get uh, on the topic of sexual and reproductive health. And which basically says that the spillover mechanism was go and tell your friends what you learned today. 
And the outcome was that the outcome that we measured was there were several questions that measured your confidence in answering or talking about sexual health issues. And we created an index that aggregated all of those values. And <clears throat> what they were trying to do was replicate a study called the ASSIST, the A Stop Smoking in Schools trial. You can tell that Klago really loves the acronym. Um, and what they wanted, what they did in the ASSIST study was they talked to peer supporters, they told them that smoking was bad. And they said, go and tell your friends that smoking is really bad. And that intervention worked really well. What did we find? Well, we found that the individuals who were treated had a relative increase of the um, of their index in answering and talking about sexual health topics, but there was no spillover effect. There was nothing. There is, it's basically zero, regardless of which method you use to try to corroborate. And so I would say that this was really disheartening when I found out about this because it basically means that this whole hoo-ha about we are considered to be um, interconnected and we are not independent draws of the probability distribution. Although true in theory, when it comes to practice, it's a little bit harder to try to, um, to, to, to point down. Um, what happened? We, there are several hypotheses about what we think happened. Uh, first and foremost, that sexual health topics are really hard to talk about, uh, especially amongst teenagers. And so um, telling someone not to smoke is very different from trying to convince someone to um, have appropriate consent when engaging in sexual behaviors. Uh, additionally, I think that the outcome was too broadly defined. Uh, the, the intervention was not as clear focused on what it wanted to do and what it was intending to do. And so this made the possibility for influence to be a little bit harder. And the spillover mechanism, mechanism was weak and was really hard to enforce. And basically what happened was that this, the social media, what they said is that the peer supporters needed to go and talk to their friends on social media and tell them about what they learned in the intervention. And not all of them did it when they did it, they did it um, half-heartedly and it was just, not a really good spillover mechanism for what they wanted to learn. Um, the team that ran the intervention tried to do an estimation of what happened in a qualitative uh, manner, and they found similar results, essentially that the intervention had no spillover effect, which, which I think is a result in itself, but go tell that to a journal. Anyway. Um, as a, as a very brief summary, um, interference is hard, but it's not impossible. Um, you really need to wonder if it's less prevalent than you originally considered. If, if the thing that you consider to be spilling over really does spill over. And I think that that's something that um, I mean, at least I take away from this and like the team at the University of Glasgow takes away from this. And that you have and you need strong assumptions, but if you're able to believe and there's evidence that those assumptions hold, uh, there are important results that await on the other side. Um, this also means that there's a lot of work to do in this topic. It, it would be interesting to see what happens when you have different aggregation functions. What happens if you not only consider the average of your treated friends, but the um, only if more than half of your friends are treated, uh, you then get treatment. 
and I, I think that there is there are many 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 questions that you could start asking with this framework and with this methodology and i find that fascinating and i hope to be able to continue working on that um no one really considers what happens when you talk about different network generating functions as in it's really different when you make friends in a school as to when you make friends in an organization that has a very strong hierarchical nature that imposes a certain relationship or friendship structure on the individuals. Um, what happens if the people are connected at random? What happens if the people are connected via different um, observable or unobservable characteristics, which is one of the things that I was talking about at the beginning. And something that I'm, fascinated by is, is there an optimal number of treated individuals? Imagine if you could narrow down the number of individuals to do a cost benefit analysis that says you do not have to treat an entire population, you only have to treat 30% of the population if you select them properly, and then uh, you might be able to reach um, and achieve the same results. Um, all of which I, th I find to be uh, really interesting and fascinating question. Uh, this is a list of my sources and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Sorry if it was a little bit um, intense. I can speak uh, slower. I could go back to the chicken, anything you need. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, on behalf of everybody here and, and the audience members, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time and presenting this very interesting talk. I'm really looking forward to the discussion.